All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Friday Masterclasses with the Adobe Evangelist. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Design and Photography Evangelist here at Adobe, and it's my pleasure once again to be streaming to you live on a Friday morning, my time, Friday afternoon, Friday evening, whatever time it is, your time. Uh, so we're going to kick things off today with... Um, a topic that's kind of fun, it's it's one that I like to refer to as 10 tools you probably didn't know, or maybe you know some of them and maybe you forgot about them. So I don't want to be presumptuous and say you don't know any of these because obviously some of these, if you've been around Photoshop and Lightroom for a while, some of these you will absolutely know. Uh, but for those of you who are new to the programs or you know maybe you have been using them for a while and you just kind of forgot about some of these things uh hopefully I'll, I'll refresh your memory about some techniques and tips and hopefully show you some that you haven't seen before all right so with that said um thanks everyone for being here i see a bunch of people in the chat already like mike and moat avoid and viola Steve, Victoria, Sean, General Kenobi, once again, uh, Caroline, um, Roger, and I thought I saw Tim a minute ago. I'm sure he's here. I, I know he's here. Christine, Fury, welcome everyone. And uh, let's go ahead and just remind everybody, if you're watching this on Twitter, you're watching this on my YouTube, you're watching this on a Creative Cloud YouTube, you're watching this on Facebook, wherever you happen to be watching this from, that's cool. You can hang out wherever you are, uh, obviously, and watch it wherever you feel comfortable, wherever you like to watch things. But if you want to participate in the chat, the chat will take place at b.net slash Adobe Live. So that's the chat I'm looking at right now. That's the one I'm giving the shout outs from, like Michelle just popped in. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, if you want to say something, uh, I can't monitor all the chats and do a demo at the same time, so that's the chat I'm going to be focused on. Uh, so, once again, thanks everyone for being here, and without further ado, since I always run out of time with more content than I have uh, time, I'm going to go ahead and dive right in to um, 10 tools, and it may not be a tool per se, it may be a technique, or it may be a filter, it may be a menu item, but 10 tools you uh, probably didn't know about in Lightroom and Photoshop, or Photoshop and Lightroom, or Lightroom and Photoshop. I don't know. We'll start with Lightroom. All right, so I'll switch over to my desktop, and I've got my desktop open here. I'm in Lightroom Classic. Uh, we'll be doing Lightroom Classic, Photoshop, and I may pop open Lightroom as well. But uh, those are the main ones we're going to be talking about today. And again, 10 things and i know that i could do 10 things at you know my eyes closed so we're probably going to get way more than 10 so let's cram in as many as we can for the time we have all right so with that said uh first one and this is an oldie but a goodie let me bring back up my notes so i can make sure i, I don't miss any this is an oldie but a goodie but th this is one that's been in lightroom classic for as long as i can remember and it's down here on your tool panel when you're in grid view. So if you don't see your tool panel, like I don't see mine anymore, hit the letter T to bring it up for tools, T for tools. And you can configure, this is not the tip, but you can configure what's on the tool panel from this right-hand menu. So I've got a bunch of things turned on. And the one thing you want to turn on if you want to follow along is the one called Painter. Painter is the one, that, the tip we're going to be talking about right now. So what's Painter? Painter is this little paint can in the bottom left-hand corner of your tool panel. And this paint can allows you to quickly and selectively apply a bunch of things to a bunch of photos um, just by spraying them. That's, that's why it's a paint can. So if I click the paint can, um, it picks the tool up and then I can choose in this menu to the right of it what I want the paint can to do. So if you wanted to apply a bunch of keywords, you wanted to apply um, color labels, if you wanted to apply a flag, like a pick flag, a star rating, uh, specific metadata, uh, settings to the photo itself, or uh, rotation, which I'm on right now, or you wanna put it in your target collection. You can do any one of those things quickly and easily. So for example, I'm on rotation, and so rotation gives me the choices of rotation. So I can either rotate uh, left, counterclockwise, right, clockwise, flip the image horizontally or vertically. 
So this is very helpful if you had a bunch of images that came in, maybe you were pointing your camera down and sometimes it loses its orientation when it's pointed down like that. So some may be vertical when they should be horizontal, some should be horizontal when they should be vertical. This would be a quick way to change them. So for example, I've just, none of my need changing, but I've got these on uh, rotate left counterclockwise. And so now if I just spray, just wipe across the images, you can see how quickly that is. Um, so Fury says, I, didn't, I did, didn't even know about the painter. Yeah, that's, that's what today's about. Just showing you things that have been in these applications for several months, if not several years, and a lot of people just overlook them. They never see them, so that, or they never pay attention to that icon, so they never go in to see what it's all about. And obviously, I can undo that, put them all back, and if I um, go back, I'm still on the painter, so if I wanted to go in and mark them all with a color label, I can go to, to the labels, I can say I wanna mark certain ones green, so I don't, have to go, I don't have to go directly in a row. I can just click, I can click and drag, I can do it selectively, I can skip ones that I don't want to be green, and I can click on the ones that I do. So it's a way of applying things quickly to photos visually because you're just looking at the thumbnails and you're going over it. Uh, so um, this is making my day. A bunch of people are saying they've never used this. This is sorcery. This is uh, the spray is so cool. So uh, that's letting me know that I'm on the right track showing these kinds of things that have been around but a lot of people just, again, never see them or miss them. All right, so the spray can, once you're done with it, because you still have it in your hand, so it's still showing me, and that's kind of cool. It's even changing the icon to green, letting me know that I'm gonna be painting with green if I do this. Once you're done with the, your, your spray can, you click to put it back. So you basically you pick it up, spray. When you're done with it, you click back where it goes to put it back or set it down. All right, the next one. And this is one that's been around for a while. Uh, let me go into one of these here. Let's go into develop. So I just went to the develop mode for module for this particular photo. And as you can see, this photo is already in color. It's got a nice pink mask and COVID vaccine, so forth and so on. If you want to quickly, like instantly get to a black and white, you know you can go use a profile, you can go change the color, you can do, go do all these things, but hitting the letter V as in Victor, will quickly change your photo or selected photos to black and white. So it changes the mode to black and white so you can instantly see what that image is gonna look like as a black and white. And then hitting letter V again puts it, restores it back to whatever it was, in my case, color. So letter V quickly for a black and white when you wanna see what that image might look like as a black and white without having to go find it in, in, the, in the menus or whatever. Now, side note, what if you wanted to do multiple images at the same time? So I select these four, I go to my develop menu, and again, this is something I've been using since day one, but I just wanna make sure you see it. There's something down here, and this wasn't in my top 10, but this is something that you should know about. It's called auto sync, because by default, it's off, it's on sync. And that means that it will only apply um, the same edit to multiple photos if you click it. But if I turn it on, and I leave it on, I never turn it off, except for when I'm showing a demo. If I leave it on, then that means no matter what I do to one photo, like I've got four photos selected, but I'm on one, it will do it to all of them. So if I hit the letter V on this one, they all became black and white, as we can see down here in the film strip. So they instantly all became black and white, as many photos as I selected, quickly and easily, uh, applying the same edit to multiple photos. So that's uh, a fast way to do that just by having um, your Lightroom Classic set to auto sync. Now I know a lot of people are using Lightroom or Lightroom on your mobile devices. Sadly, Lightroom on mobile and Lightroom desktop, I'm not talking about Classic, I'm talking about the other version, does not have auto sync, but it does have the next best thing, which is copy and paste. So if I, um, Let's undo, undo, put those back. If I wanted to, let's say, adjust a photo. Uh, let's, well, let's, let's take the fifth one and let's go into develop and let's make that one black and white. And um, now I want to apply that same black and white effect to multiple photos uh, in Lightroom or Lightroom Classic. I can hit edit copy or there's a copy button right there on the bottom in Classic. 
So I, if I hit copy, that's going to bring up this dialog box that's asking me what attributes do I want to copy. So I could copy everything. I can say, nope, let me pick and choose by choosing none. And I can then go into black and white mix, for example, or and basic tone and white balance or whatever things I want to copy from this photo because you don't have to copy everything. And the one thing that I like about Classic, because again, Classic does this, but Lightroom doesn't, even with a copy and paste, is Classic can also copy the crop. So if you spent time getting an image perfectly cropped, you can also copy that if you didn't already do an auto sync because uh, this one will copy the crop, the other one will not copy the crop. All right, so if I copy this and then go to selected photos, uh, let's say these, these two, and then go into develop and paste, it should paste if I copy the right thing, apparently I did not, but it would paste whatever it is that you copied. Uh, apparently I did not copy the right thing. Hang on, let's go to copy. That's the problem when you check, when you uncheck things like treatment and profile is probably the one I want. There we go, copy. And now if I go to these, that's what happens when you're selective. You're, you're, you gotta make sure you're you have the right one enabled. There we go. I get my black and white. All right, so treatment and profile, because of the way I did the black and white, that was considered a treatment and profile change. So that's what, I didn't have it checked the first time, so that's what didn't get copied. This time it did. Uh, the bear is not wearing a mask correctly. Sure, he's not. You're right. He's not covering his little nose there. Or is he? Is he? It's hard to tell. I think the nostrils are covered, so I think he's good. Okay, anyway, um, next up, let's go into, let's get out of this one, and let's go into this one. All right, actually, let's go to this one. Here we go. So many choices, so little time. I think I want to go back to this. Okay, let's go in here, and yeah, this is where I want to be. All right, so I want to go to this photo, and let's develop it. And let's go in and show you another. This is like, I would say in Lightroom, 99% of the um, features are exposed, meaning it's a menu option, it's an icon, it's something you can visually see to do something. But there's that 1% of features that, don't have an icon and in some cases don't even have a menu item like it's just you got you have to know how to do it and one of those items the one that comes to mind is setting your black and white points to cre increase the dynamic range so for example i've got a photo here and i'm in the develop module and uh fury's asking i think a question how did you sync i missed that fury if you go into your develop module and you have um you are developing multi, you have to have multiple photos selected. So here I'll select two photos. Go into develop, then it will be down here in the bottom right, sync versus auto sync. So that will not show if you only have one photo selected. So if you're not seeing it, that might be why. All right, so let me go back. Let's go here and click. This is one I want, develop. Okay, so back to the black and white points. So you have a, a slider for blacks, you have a slider for whites. Um, you can set have have Lightroom set the dynamic range of the photo by holding down your shift key, increasing the dynamic range, I should say, by holding down your shift key and clicking on the handle. Now the handle may move, it may not move, it may move just a little bit, it may move a lot because it will depend on the photo. So just double clicking moved it plus 30. Now if I double click black, it moved it negative 16. So that increased, it auto estimated what the dynamic range of the photo should be based on shift double click. So every photo is gonna be different. Every photo is not gonna be the same numbers. Every photo may not, you know, may move a lot, may move a little, it just depends on the photo. It just depends on what you're working with. But that shift double click the handles for black and white, blacks and whites, 
is one that I, I don't know that there's a menu option for that. I don't know that there's a right click or anything for that. I just know that you have to know the shift double click. Okay, while we're on this particular photo, this particular photo I shot back uh, in December, um, 2020, 2020 um, and I shot this with my iPhone 12 Pro Max. However, since that time, we have come out with a profile for Apple's RAW. So Apple Pro RAW has a profile now in your um, in your profiles. Now, luckily, uh, unless you have old photos like I do, photos pre this profile, you won't have to worry about it because when you bring in those Pro RAW photos into Lightroom Classic or Lightroom, it will automatically pick this profile for you. So when you shoot them even on your phone and bring them into Lightroom Mobile, it'll automatically pick this profile for you. But if you've got some older photos in your catalog or in your collections that don't have uh, that profile applied, you can go and apply it after the fact. And what this will do is it will apply a look to your photos to make it look more like it did on the back of your phone. Because uh, the, you know a lot of times we shoot a phone, it's vibrant blue, looks great, so forth and so on. And then we bring in a Lightroom, which applies a very mute like um, not jazzed up raw profile to it. And you're like, what happened to all my look? It doesn't look as good. That's why it doesn't look as good because we tone it down. So this is for people that were saying, well, I want it to look as good as it looked on my phone. You can apply that profile. Now watch what happens. I'm going to put it back on Adobe Color, which was the default. It doesn't look as good. But here's, here's another little trick that even if you, now I'm not going to change the profile, but I am going to reset my edits. If I come down and hit reset, watch what happens. All the sliders should go back to zero, but it also applied the profile. It's saying, I'm even going to set this as the default for this image because I know what this image was shot with. So you're going to get that profile. You, in other words, you all get, now you have to go out of your way not to have it. You'd have to go change it to something else, except for, again, the photos that were already in your library. But if you reset those photos in your library or just choose it, you'll have them. All right, next up. Um, dun, 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 dun. Let's go into, let's go do this one. Let's go into this one and let's go grab a portrait here. All right, this is, uh, and oh, let's get zoom out. All right, let's go into crop. So I'm gonna hit the letter R for crop. It's an old joke. Anyway, I'm gonna hit the letter R for crop. And a couple of tips and techniques here. So when you crop, it will automatically just make the crop the full size of your frame, full size of your original image. And you can go in and change your settings. You can say maintain the aspect original aspect ratio. You can lock the original aspect ratio. You can unlock it so you can crop freely. But one of the things, again, that's, that's kind of hidden is what if I wanted to turn this landscape-oriented image into a portrait? Let's say I want to print out a portrait size, a, a eight by 10 or four by five or whatever. You can hit the letter while you're in the crop, you can hit the letter X on your keyboard to turn the crop. So that will turn it. Now it's gonna turn it in the, in the same aspect ratio. So it may not work perfectly for you, but you could always, if you're unlocked, you can always expand it out to whatever it is you want it to be. And of course you can also um, change it to, um, you can change it to an aspect ratio that you want. So if I wanted a four by five, eight by 10, that would be the, uh, the aspect ratio to give me that crop. Okay, I'm gonna escape out of it. I'm gonna hit the crop again to, to reset it back to normal. And the next thing, um, is it the same as working with, working in raw or pseudo raw? Is what the same? Christine, I'm not sure what you're referring to is, when you say, is it the same? Um, I was just reading the rest to make sure I didn't miss something. All right, I, I, I expand upon your question and then I can hopefully address it. All right, anyway, back to the, uh, the crop rectangle, whether you flip it or not, uh, you notice that mine is set to a rule of thirds and we use this to compose the image because you're, you're, what, you're, what you're supposed to do is put something that's interesting in the photo, like her eyes, in the intersection, one, at least one of the intersections of the rule of thirds. But there are other crop 
aspect ratios or ratios. So if I hit the letter O on my keyboard, it will cycle through them all so that I can see all the different ones. And uh, the golden circle, this is a nice one. This is one I wanted to get to because this one will show you the two by three, four by five, five by seven. It'll show you the different ones. It'll call out the numbers to let you know where that crop would be. Uh, so that's pretty cool that it lets, lets me see that. But just hitting the letter O will continue cycling through until you get back to the one you want. All right. Um, let me go in and, and uh, this next one's for the adjustment brush. So I'm going to go to the adjustment brush, which is right here. And uh, you've seen me do this a million times. On the adjustment brush, of course, you can make whatever sliders you want. You can make your own presets. You can do all this. But uh, I usually like to use a preset because what the preset will do is it will allow me to zero out everything else. So for example, let's say I wanted to paint with exposure. Well, that all that simply does is zero out everything else and gives me a little bit of exposure. So now if I start painting like under her neck, which is too much exposure, uh, I can pull that down and I can adjust it. But you notice it gives me that little point, that little, um, that little point in the middle. That little point, when you hover over it, will show you first what you paint it. But if you right click on it, here's what people don't really, really realize. First of all, you well, even if you don't right click on it, you can move it. So if you painted an area and you didn't get it just right, you can move the whole thing around and put it wherever you want. Secondly, you can duplicate it. So you can put a second one down. So remember, I always make the joke, you can't go beyond 100 on the slider. So like if I go up to 100 exposure and 100 is not enough, or I go to 100 dehaze, and I, which I probably wouldn't do. But if I go to 100 texture and 100 texture is not enough, I can duplicate it and literally have 200 texture because it's duplicating that effect on top of the original. Now the original is there. I can still move this one and put it wherever I want. Uh, so I have this one to choose from and this one to choose from, and they both have their own settings. So if I go to that one and say, well, that one's too bright, I can turn that one down and the other one will stay exactly wherever it was as bright as it is. And I can move that around and kind of create these cool effects as I do that. I should have did that in the special effects one last week. Anyway, um, you get the idea. So as many of these pinpoints as you put down for your selective adjustments, such as um, healing brush, the healing brush, or not healing brush, the adjustment brush, the radial filter, or graduated filter, you can duplicate them and up, double them, double them up, triple them up, whatever it is you need to do. Adjust each one individually, move them around to move the adjustment around, so forth and so on. And lastly, you can also just simply delete them. So if you don't like that one uh, anymore, you can delete it and get rid of that effect since this is all non-destructive. Um, non all right, next up, uh, let's go into, we did that one. All right, uh, I'm a fan of sharpening in Lightroom. And when I sharpen people, I tend, especially, uh, female subjects or subjects with soft skin, let's just put it that way, like children, babies, whatever, whatever it is, somebody that their skin should not be rough. We shouldn't be making their skin rougher than it is. Then in that case, when I, when I sharpen people, I tend to want to only sharpen the things that should be sharp, her jewelry, her eyes, her, maybe her lips, teeth, clothing, hair, those things should be sharpened, but the skin should not. So luckily, Lightroom has a mask so that you can mask out those things. But Lightroom used to have, Lightroom Classic used to have, a preset called Sharpen Faces. And that's exactly what this was for. It was for sharpening people where you didn't want the skin to get sharper. You just wanted all the other att attributes to get sharper. So... That I said it used to have it. It went away. But notice, I brought it back. Like, I still have my sharpened faces and my sharpened scenic. So how do you get yours back? Because they're gone by default. Well, if you go to your presets and you click the little plus sign to bring out the preset menu and you come down to manage presets. This is only in Lightroom Classic because Lightroom never had it. 
but you can go create it in Lightroom or import this preset into Lightroom if you want. All right, so um, in Lightroom Classic, we go to Manage Presets, and you'll scroll down until you find Classics or Classic General. You want this; these will both be turned off. All of the uh, the these classic ones will be turned off. I turn back on classic general and classic video, which gave me those, and you click save, and that gave me those presets back. So why did I want them back? Because they do what I just described automatically. So for example, watch the masking slider. The presets that Lightroom gives you by default now are none, light, medium, and heavy. So let's say I go to medium. Well, it just moves over the amount to 45. If I go to heavy, it moves it over to 76, but it does not touch masking at all. Now, if I go back to none, then it just zeroes them out. But if I go to faces general, or I'm sorry, sorry, sharpen faces under uh, classic general, it not only moved the amount, but it moved the radius detail and the masking. So let me show you what that really did. If we, um, if we hold down the Option or Alt key for the mask and slide it back and forth, this would be zero. So this is what the other sharpening does, which every, the whole image just goes away or turns white. That means it's sharpening everything. When you mask and you, you bring the slider over to just see those details that I mentioned, teeth, hair, eyes, eyebrows, outfit, those are the areas that are now getting sharpened. The skin, is, which is now shown in black, is not being sharpened. So this masking slider lets you control what areas of your portrait will be sharpened. And um, that's why I like sharpened faces, because it just does that automatically. I don't have to think about it. I could go and adjust it and say, oh yeah, give me more sharpening. But it will automatically create a mask based on your person so that you get, um, so that you only get the area sharpened that should be sharpened. So now I get a nice sharpened, sharper photo. Um, there we go. I get a nice sharper photo that is uh, not, is affecting the areas I want, but not affecting the areas I don't want. All right, next up, let's move on off this photo. Now, um, last week's masterclass, I was showing special effects. We're going to come back to this because there's, I ran out of time. There's some things I didn't finish. But uh, a couple people that especially live here in Atlanta asked, well, where did you shoot this? And this is on a rooftop, but which one? There's lots of rooftops downtown that you can get away with photographing from. Uh, which one is this from? So I like to have my photos geotagged. And you'll notice that um, in the one, that I, the production shot that I shot with my phone, well, there's a little flag there. That little flag says that this photo, because your phone has GPS, added the GPS coordinates to the photo. So those coordinates come into Lightroom. Lightroom knows exactly where this photo was. But let's say I didn't have that production shot. Let's say I only had the shots that I shot with my camera and the location was not there. Well, if I go to the map module, which right now I'm on the Eiffel Tower. There's the Eiffel Tower right there. If I go to the map module and search for whatever the location was. In this case, it was Georgia, George, helps if you spell it right, Georgia Tech Hotel and Conference Center. If I just search for Georgia Tech Hotel, well, lo and behold, it brings it up on the map and I can even see if I hover over the production shot that's already there and that's pretty much exactly where we were uh, I can take the other photos that aren't geotagged and drag them to that spot to add the coordinates to them. So now those photos know where they were approximately or know where I was approximately when they were taken. So if I go back to the uh, grid view, now this photo has a little flag and the other photo has a little flag. And whatever you see that little flag means you can click on it to go right to the map to see where this photo was taken. So now that other, there's another photo that I just realized this photo was taken on that same rooftop. It was taken over here though. It's taken right about there. So I can drag photos onto a map again to 
know exactly where I was when I was taking the photo. And when I export it, if I export it with those coordinates out, the people that are getting this photo will know where it was taken to. All right, next up. Um, speaking of um, sending people photos, uh, here's another kind of hidden one in Lightroom Classic is that you can always export photos out. You've always been able to export them out since day one. Um, but you typically then have to figure out how to get them to the person. Like, do I text them? Do I uh, email them? Do I put them in a Dropbox? Do I, whatever, how do I get them to them? Well, Lightroom Classic, since a long time ago, has had the ability to email directly from Lightroom Classic. So if I wanted to email these four photos, I could select them, go up to my file menu, and there's email photos right there. It's, it's a menu option right under the file menu, email photos, and that will take the photos, how many ever you select. It will apply whatever export setting you choose. So you could say, hey, make them a little larger, um, high quality, and you can go create your own preset. So if you don't like any of the presets to come with it, like I created one called email for web, email for print, uh, for Twitch email, that was probably when I was showing how to do this on Twitch. Um, you could uh, choose whatever preset you want and then it, the ones that are built in or you make your own and then it will export the photos out, attach them to a new email with that setting, watermark, however you want to do it, and then you just send an email. Now, this only works with email clients. So Apple Mail, Outlook, so forth and so on. It won't work with a web browser email like Google, Gmail. So if you, have a, if you have a physical application that it can launch and attach the photos to, then away you go. Now you might say, well, I don't have my addresses here to look up and you could um, you know, type them in. Don't worry, just put your subject in, put your email client, your photos, what quality. And then when you hit send, it will create a new email with all that stuff in it and it just will be waiting to be addressed. And then you will type in your email addresses as you always do, pulling them from your contact list, whatever, however you get them in. All right. Uh, dun, 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 dun. I'm just making sure I'm not missing anything here in the, in the chat. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. I'm not seeing any burning questions there. All right. Let's keep going. All right. Uh, okay. Here's another one. This one's kind of been around for a while, but it kind of changed over time. So you see me all the time go from the grid to full screen. That's the letter F. But that wasn't always the case. It wasn't always hitting F would take you into full screen. They made it F takes you into full screen, which I, I, I applaud that decision. But it meant that you also lost the ability to change the what you see when you're not in full screen. Like right now, I'm seeing everything. I'm seeing the menu. The menu, the, the, the bar for the application window, then all this other stuff. Well, there used to be a way to just make Lightroom full screen without having to do that. So you can do that still, but it's not just F anymore, it's Shift F. So if I hold down my Shift key and hit the letter F, it toggles away the application window bar. If I hold down Shift and hit F again, it makes Lightroom full screen. And this is a great mode to be in when you have clients in the room and you want them to walk over and you don't want them to see you know, anything else, just this window. Um, that way they, they, they come over to the monitor and they don't see anything but your, your Lightroom with your identity plate and your studio name and so forth and so on. And hitting Shift F again will take you back out. So F goes full screen or not, Shift F toggles between the three views. All right, um, all right let's move on to Photoshop. Those are more than 10 things I think I've shown you in Lightroom, but let's hop over to Photoshop now and pick things back up where we were. All right, uh, this, is, this is the first one we're gonna do. All right, so this one, obviously old style pizzeria sign, taken at an angle from the street, cool. But what if I need it straight on? Like right now it's tilted up, at an angle, so forth and so on, but I need the, the whole sign to be facing me straight on. Well, there is a crop tool that's been in Photoshop for years and years and years buried under the regular crop tool, and it's called Perspective Crop. So if I go to Crop, this is the crop we normally see. And if I go and hold it down, 
on the crop tool, the letter C, it will give me another tool called perspective crop. What does perspective crop do that's different? Well, perspective crop, I still drag out a crop rectangle the way I normally would. But the difference is the corner handles are movable. So I don't like normally a crop is either in or out the whole thing. But now I could go in and adjust the corner handles to the aspect ratio of whatever it is I'm trying to crop. So I can go in and say, well, I want that one to be out a little bit more. I want this handle to be up a little bit more to kind of match the sign. So that's what I'm doing. I'm using the handles to kind of match the orientation of the sign. Once I get it matched, and by the way, I recommend if you're doing this, that when you, when you start dragging out, make sure one of the corners is, is not gonna move. Make sure it's exactly where you want it to be and then you move the other three. It just tends to work better that way. All right, but anyway, now that we got it uh, kind of oriented, the, the crop rectangle is oriented the same way as the, um, as the pizzeria sign. And you also get this grid to help you line things up. So if I didn't have that quite lined up, I can use the grid to get that just right. And I don't have this quite right. So let's get the grid and lay that down. The grid's very helpful in this case. Okay, I got the grid now lined up just right. And now when I hit enter, it not only crops it, but it straightens it out exactly the way your crop handles were set. So perspective crop, an awesome, awesome way of doing this to get something lined up exactly the way you need it. All right, next up, uh, I'm gonna close this one. And go to this one. All right. Uh, we have one of our smiling engineers here. And this is something that um, it's kind of once you see it, when you start retouching photos, you can't unsee it. Once you know to look for it, you're always looking for it. So uh, the guy's wearing a t-shirt, no problem. But what I, what I hate is when I see like obvious, uh, not wrinkles but folds or wrinkles on the sides or outline of the shirt so i normally go in and liquefy them and liquefy is not a new thing it's been around for years and years and years but there is something new in it so first of all i'm just going to go to liquefy and i'm going to go fix those uh, areas that i talked about so i've got my um, warp tool and i can just go kind of like pull that in a little bit so it's not sticking out so much pull that one in a little bit and you typically want to make the size of your brush just maybe slightly bigger than the area you're about to push and just you don't end up with dents or things that just look odd so just kind of straightening this out a little bit um and again it's a t-shirt so it's, you know, what can we expect <laughs> it shouldn't be expected to be perfect and you can also pull out so pulling in doesn't always have to be the case you can also pull out um, to kind of fix a seam or just an outline now, that wasn't the trick. It was just to get you into liquefy. Now that we're into liquefy, uh, the one that's kind of fun, and, and people do it now all the time, we use face aware liquefy. Now, before, if you wanted to, like, say, well, the side of his face is sticking out a little bit, then you might go in and just warp it in and just kind of even it up a little bit. But uh, here, let me zoom in, by the way, while we're at this. All right, so let's go back to warp. Now you can still go in and do that. You can still go in and fix little things that may be uh, extru ex you know, poking out, whatever, just, just to make it like smoother, more even, even. But let's undo that. And let's go to the, the icon. It looks like a face because this is face aware liquefy. When you click face aware liquefy, it identifies the faces in your, in your photo, even if you have more than one face. So if you had more than one face over here in the menu, it would actually say face one, face two, face three. Well, it only sees one face, so that's the only one face we have to worry about. Now, all the sliders deal with that one face. So if I wanted to adjust his nose um, width, for example, his nose is fine, but let's say he wanted his nose narrower or wider, I could adjust that and it's adjusting the nose. But the trick or the tip is that you can do it with the sliders, but you can also do it on canvas. You notice that as I hover over the different parts of the face, they light up with, with an interface. So if I hover over his eyes, for example, and I want to make his eyes bigger or smaller, I can just drag his eye and make his eye creepy or less creepy. And, and um, when Face Aware Liquify first came out, 
it treated both eyes the same. Like you could only adjust both eyes to be bigger or both eyes to be smaller. And as we all know that a lot of times when we take photos, even our own photos, our one eye looks bigger than the other one. So now you could go in and adjust that one eye to be even or to match the other eye in the photo. So it doesn't look like one eye is significantly bigger than the other one. Now we can also go in here and um, for example, the, the smile width, we can control that. We can control the, uh, the forehead. So like a lot of people think their forehead's too big. They could go in and adjust their forehead. And same thing with the chin. And so Face Aware Liquify has sliders. And of course, everything I'm doing here is doing it on the sliders. But you also have the ability to go right in and do it on the um, on <laughs> on the uh, actual uh, person's face. So you have an interface. So I can make his make his smile less smiley or more smiley just by dragging up and down on those circles. All right. So face aware liquify identifies a face and lets you go in and do it. Um, yeah, liquify is fun. So now, one uh, bonus tip, I, I'm going to cancel out of this, so all everything I just did was undone. If I would have said okay, it would have done it permanently on that image. So if you want to do it non-destructively, then you want to make sure you go in uh, before you run it and say convert for smart filters. Now when I go run it, if I go to filter and go to liquify and um, adjust his forehead down and his chin up, and his uh, one eye bigger or smaller, the other eye bigger or smaller. And of course, I, I can go back and do the wrinkles in the shirt, but you get the idea. Click OK. That will create this um, smart filter layer so that you can always go back in and redo it or change it or turn it off if you don't want it. So that way we didn't permanently change the pixels. So that way, that's before, and that's after, uh, just quickly and easily making those adjustments. All right, uh, next up, let's close this one. And nope, this one. All right, um, we have this motocross shot where it looks like he's jumping over a cloud and it's just the, the angle and position of the shot. Uh, there's probably some rocks or something behind this and it just looks that. What if I wanted to make him go him or her make him make them go the other way like i want them to turn you know 180 degrees and go off the cliff into the clouds um well i could make a selection duplicate the layer move them over transform them turn them so forth and so on and then cover up the old one like fill in the old one with content where fill because it's a nice easy sky so that'd be easy to do but that would be several operations to do that where you could now do it all in one tool. There's a tool called the Content Aware Move Tool. Now, I've created a custom tool panel, so I've pulled mine out, but this is what it looks like. Um, it's, I don't remember what tool it's under by default. It's probably under your um, patch and healing tools. If not, it's under one of your sets of tools. But anyway, it looks like a cross here. And you can get to, yeah, it's under the, it's under the patch because it's the letter J, just like the patch tool. So under your patch tool, you could get to this content aware um, move tool. And um, when you're in that tool, you can either make your selection with other tools or you can make your selection with this tool. So I, I'm going to grab my stylus and I'm just going to make a very loose liberal selection around this here. Now, I recommend you, even though you could use um, object selection tool or select subject or whatever and get it perfect, I recommend you give it a little space. Like, don't try and make it perfect. Like, I could have made that perfect where it was a tight selection all the way around them, but it actually works better when you have a little bit of a wiggle room around the subject. Now that I've got the subject selected, you can literally pick it up with this tool. So I'm not holding down any keys. I'm just going to pick it up and move it over. And you'll notice the minute I move it, because I had the check box or I had the um, option here set to transform on, transform on drop, that's checked off. That gives me this transformation window uh, or this transformation box where I can now scale it, 
move it, rotate it, whatever, and including right click and flip horizontal. So now I, I can scale, move it, I can scale it down, I can put them wherever I want them to be, like a little bit higher in the sky, a little bit more into the clouds. Um, maybe I don't want to make it that small, make it a little bit bigger. But now once ever, when, I'm, when I'm done messing with it, like turning it, flipping it, moving it, scaling it, getting it where I want, then I click OK or I click the confirmation and it does it. Meaning it transforms this one, fills in the, the, the background with the right sky, gets rid of the other one <laughs> all in one operation. And I'm on the background and I have multiple layers. It did it all from the background. Um, now keep in mind, the color may be off. Let's say I'm moving it from a blue sky onto a brown wall, brick wall. Then the color may be off. So if the color's off, before you deselect, uh, try changing your structure and color options in the bar. So changing the, the color to a higher number uh, really didn't make a difference on this blue sky, but Try a lower number, higher number until it blends better into what you're trying to move it onto. All right, so let's, um, and then you can deselect because you're done. So now we've uh, content aware move when you need to move something from one part of the scene to another and you want it to do it all in one operation. Okay, next up, um, let's close this one. And let's go back to Jesse here. All right, uh, I've, I've used Select and Mask and Select Subject to cut out images for months and months and months and months, if not years now. But there was another selection method that really didn't get a lot of play when it first came out because it really required your subject to be shot with shallow depth of field. What I mean by that for the non-photographers in the room, you notice that our subject is nice and, nice and focused and the background's out of focus, shallow depth of field. Um, if you have an image with shallow depth of field where your subjects in focus and the background or the other stuff is out of focus, then there's a way to select it based on the focus. So uh, one of those secret things that most people never try, select focus area. So it's a menu option, select focus area when you choose it. It will um, automatically mask out the parts that it thinks were uh, out of focus. So in this case, it did a little too much. It got rid of some of his clothing and didn't do enough with the hair. So I could go in, There's a, luckily there's a slider. So I can uh, drag the slider more in range of saying, no, 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 I know you're being picky about the, um, the select subject, but I'm gonna say you can, now if I go too far, um, if I let it calculate, it'll bring back the whole thing. So that's about where I want to be. Now, of course, it, if, if it were OK, I can click OK and be done with it. It will create a new layer with a mask. But because it's not OK, because I can still see some of the background in his hair, I can go right into Select and Mask from the Select Focus area. I believe that's a fairly new feature. I don't think that was there originally. So when I go into Select and Mask, it just takes me right into Select and Mask from that selection. And then I can go in and I'm already on the Refine Edge tool. And I can go in and refine uh, the hair. All right. And I can go in and say that I want this to be object aware versus color. And I can also say that I want, okay, decontaminated colors is already on. And if there are any areas that need to be filled back in, I can go and fill those areas back in. There's a little bit of sweater that got missed over there. And a little bit of sweater here on the edge. All right. Now when I click OK, that will still be a new layer with a mask. So I have both options to choose from. The original one from uh, Select Focus Area, the new one with Selected Mask, and of course the original with the uh, background still there. So I have... Um, the ability to quickly select objects, people, subjects, based on if they're in focus and the background is out of focus. All right, uh, next, and I didn't have to draw any selections around it or anything to do that. All right, next up, let's close this one. 
Ooh, I'm running out of time. I got five minutes left. Okay, let's quickly do not that one. Let's do this one. Not the, let's do this one first. Okay, so you've seen me do edit sky replacement. I've done it like several times since sky replacement came out in October. And sky replacement will do just as the name implies. It will select the sky and it will bring up alternate skies or you can load your own sky and do a replacement. But a lot of times, we don't necessarily need to do a sky replacement. We just want to edit the sky we already have. So I don't need to go into sky replacement for that because one of the one of the hidden features that came with sky replacement is simply the ability to select sky. Like use that same selection that you were going to use to replace the sky and just simply select it instead. And when I go to select sky, it does just that. All it does, selects the sky, nothing else. It doesn't try and replace it. Doesn't do anything, but it makes it uh, instant selection for you. Now you can go do whatever you want. So for example, I could apply a filter to it. I could apply, for example, the uh, camera raw filter to that. And since that's the only part that got selected, it will then go in and allow me, for example, to do a dehaze. And I'm just gonna make my sky like artistic and more dramatic. I click okay, and it'll apply that to the sky. Awesome. But now my reflection is not quite right. So let's duplicate the sky, Command J, put the sky on its own layer, flip it vertically, retransform, flip vertically. Now that we got the sky flipped vertically, let's select that layer, Command or Control click, and cut it. So cut it. So now it's on the clipboard. Now we go back to the background and we use our object selection tool. That's right, there's an object selection tool that can work in a lasso or rectangle. And in this case, I need it in a lasso because what I'm gonna do is select the other reflection that's already here. So just quickly dragging that lasso around the whole thing. It does a selection of it. And now I'm just gonna to go to edit our new layer, new layer, edit, paste in, paste special, another thing you may not know is there, we're used to copy and paste, but what's paste special? Well, paste special gives me the ability to paste in two. So when I do a paste in two, that object is now being masked by that area and I could go in and move it around in that area. So I can get the sky exactly where I want it. It's a little too bright. Let's go ahead and lower the opacity of it so we can also bring back some of that mountain too. But that way we get the exact sky reflected into it. All right, last but not least, because I am going to be out of time, let's do this one. Um, this is another big hidden one that most people don't know exists. So I've got the bottle and I've got the word Agfa. So just, just a type layer on top of the photo. But I would love it if Agfa were in a font very close to or if not dead on for what the Agfa bottle was. So while the type is selected, I'm going to go to my rectangular marquee tool. And I'm just going to select the word in the photo. So I'm just dragging a selection around pixels because that's not real type. Now that I've drawn a selection around those pixels with the type layer selected, I can go up to my type menu and come down to a thing that most people never knew exist, match font. When I choose match font, that will go and look for fonts similar to that, um, that selection. And you can then click to see what they look like on your type layer that you've got selected. So I can go in and say, that's pretty much the right one. And I click OK. And now that type has been changed to that font. All right. Uh, last but not least, because we've got a minute left, let's, let's see if we can get one more in here. Oh, not that one, though. I wanted to do quickly, quickly, quickly. I oh, will do it on this one. All right, we'll grab the type tool. And we'll say, uh, Terry loves oh no no let's let's make some typos terry loves photoshopy all right i'll make it nice and big all right obviously a couple typos in there and what's worse is doing a layout and you print it and or put it on social media and it's got a typo in there so believe it or not most people never realize that photoshop has has had check spelling for years it just doesn't do it automatically so when I choose check spelling, oh yeah, that's 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 not right. Change that one. Oh yeah, that should be Photoshop. Change that one. Good, I'm done, done. 
and I don't have to export out a flyer, banner, or whatever with typos in it. You can check the spelling and write in Photoshop. All right, so uh, I see a lot of people saying I completely forgot about this. Uh, my goodness, so many things I'm learning. Thank you, you're welcome. Okay, we're out of time. So I'm gonna end it here because you know we don't want to be cut off. And like a TV show, you will be cut off if you're over your time. So with that said, stay tuned for the Daily Creative Challenge. Stay tuned for more master classes by my colleagues that are going to be doing audio, video, Photoshop, um, drawing and painting, and UI UX design. So not in that order, but they'll be doing them. All right. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.